Welcome to Sam's Business Growth Show. I'm Sam Dunning, a digital marketing, sales, and business growth evangelist. Tune in and subscribe today as I'll be interviewing business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. You'll be learning their story, how digital marketing has helped them along the way, and exclusive tips and insights to help you skyrocket your own business. Welcome back to the show. I'm delighted to have joining me today Naraj Kapoor. Naraj is the founder of Everybody Works in Sales Limited. Um, he also wrote the amazing book, Everybody Works in Sales, which is Amazon bestseller. He sold over 6,000 copies. And Naraj has actually worked in sales for over 25 years in London um, and the last eight years as a sales coach trainer. So he's worked with big companies such as Centaur Media, The Guardian Newspaper Group, and Informa. He gets results for companies through interactive training, mentoring, and keeping staff accountable. Naraj has delivered over 46 speaking slots at events, 146 training sessions, and over 3,300 sorry sales coaching sessions. <laughs> Clients include University of Buckingham and Imperial College to large corporations such as Barclays, NatWest, and Sainsbury's. Naraj, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you so much, Sam. I'm absolutely grand. Thank you. Just come off my holiday, so feeling really refreshed. Awesome. Excellent stuff. So nice, nice and ready to crack on with a, a big month ahead and uh, a good show today. Cool. So there's plenty we want to cover, Narash. Um, myself and everyone tuning in today would love to learn your story. So up from leaving school and up to setting up your own successful business. And we'd love to also know your digital marketing and business growth tips and secrets and um, any other insights along the way to help any sales professionals, marketing professionals or business owners learn how to skyrocket their own business. So if we can start from scratch really and learn your story so far from leaving school up to how you got into the business world, please my friend. Absolute pleasure. Uh, well, most people I know went to left school to go to college or get an apprenticeship or university. And I wanted to be a rock star. And oh, wow. uh, the first popular article I ever, I wrote for LinkedIn for many months without much luck. And my first popular article was me with hair and a six pack. <laughs> it was a picture of me from 1990 when I was trying to be a rock star. And I must say, I failed horribly. I can't even describe it in words. It was, you know, sometimes in these reality shows, you see these people who have no idea how bad they are. Um, that was me back in 1990. I thought I was literally God's gift to songwriting. I, I, I genuinely believed I'd be the next Bruce Springsteen. I did. Um, <laughs> you know, I did. I, I was convinced I would be. And the record producers at the time, they just took my money. Nobody told me how bad I was. Um, I was a good drummer and a decent yeah. guitar player. Not a bad songwriter. But as a singer, you've got to have a great voice. You've got to have a certain charisma and sex appeal. I had none of that. Um, so, yeah, it was a bit of a disaster. And I think when you feel so horribly so young, um, it just had a very bad effect. And I spent the next two years unemployed and depressed and became a hermit and became angry at the world. And oh, I said, well, How old were you then, Narash? Um, So I would have been 19, 18, 19. I was working on it. 20 right. I failed, so 2021 for two entire years. I was in North London uh, in Neasden on a council estate. It was just brutal. It was lonely, it was depressing. And I, I guess if you look at lessons learned in sales, it's the first big lesson you learn is you've got to take 100% responsibility. Um, you know, I blamed the government, I blamed my father, I blamed the kids <laughs> for bullying me at school. I blamed everybody but for myself. And it was a good, you know, I can look back now with great clarity, but at the time I just couldn't see it. And that's why I'm always saying to people, stop whining, stop complaining, stop blaming others. You're 100% responsible for your success and failure in life, you know? Very true. Very true. Okay. So you, you started out wanting a, a career in the, the music business, yeah. but that went a little bit sour by the sounds of it. And um, you got into a little bit of a slump as we all have at some stage in our lives. And uh, what, what happened next, my friend? Um, well, my father turned up at my house, or my, my house, my, my castle flat one day. And it was quite a surprise. You know, my father is very old school. There's no okay. hugs, no I love you, no you're... No, my mother is the opposite. Mom's a great, she's very affectionate, very loving. Dad's very old school, you know. Yeah. And he doesn't say things like that. And he just turned up one day saying, look, I, I don't like having a son that's unemployed. I, I don't think it's right you have to get yourself a job. And it was, it was a very difficult thing for a man like that to do, but I'm really grateful he did. 
And we got my CV together and we sent it out to lots of people. The problem was I had no degrees. And back in those days, you know, 25 years ago, you had to have some kind of qualification. Today, it's not as important, depending what sector you work in. But back then, it really was. I had no qualifications. And I was going through the jobs. And, and back in those days, the Evening Standard newspaper would have our top salesperson earn £2,000 this week in commission. I'm like, OK, that sounds good. <laughs> so I applied. For those jobs and i got interviews i'm like oh my god I, this is incredible and i apply i think ah sterling that was at sterling media i had okay. the interview and about three days later i started with with one interview and oh, wow. I arrived, and they gave me a script about like this give me a script give me one hour to learn it and i was on the phone and all of a sudden i'm on the phone and i'm pitching and pitching after 30 seconds they dropped me and i'm like what do i do <laughs> there was no <laughs> there was no uh, what it was just a script and you have to stay on script and so you literally hard. got there and they pretty much handed you a script and that was it handed me a script told me to get familiar with it i were rehearsing it like actors and i think when i joined there was about maybe eight or nine people and end of the week there was one person left and so i thought this is ridiculous people oh, are asking me objections but i don't know what to say because nobody had trained me properly and uh, what were you what was the business about at sterling Narash? what were you selling what were they offering Okay, so it was a gun magazine, so it was machine guns, pistols. Interesting. Okay. Now, bear in mind, I have an Irish accent. And back in the early 90s, the IRA and terrorism was causing so many problems. So Ooh. people would hear my voice. And some of them were genuinely, especially the Americans, they were genuinely concerned by my accent trying to sell their guns my magazine. It was just a disaster. <laughs> it, wasn't, <laughs> you know, it really wasn't good. It was a tough and, start by the sounds of it. Oh, it's terrible. It really was. So, but what I thought was, you know what? I like the buzz of the office, and this is the only job I can do. The, I, I'm not qualified. I have no degree, but I think I could do it. So, I applied for loads of sales jobs, and I knocked on lots of doors. And when you walk in London into offices, Sam, um, with a CV, people don't care. They're, they don't say, "Yeah, sure, come on in. We love your energy." And they don't. They slam the door in your face. And one company called Centaur Media who I had a great career with, the HR manager came back from lunch. I gave her my CV. I waited for her. I told her all the rejection I had. And she went, oh, that's impressive. Okay, that'll be 10 minutes. And she did. Then I had a proper interview. And then I started the job a month later. So that was my first proper job where I got properly trained. Well, I guess it was 1990. So it was quite limiting the training, but at least I got training. And I had some kind of guidance. And that, that's kind of how my career started. Yeah, it's better than just sitting there with a the script hoping for the best, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of scary when you have all these people from call centers call you um, or small businesses that haven't trained their staff, you know they're reading from a script. It sounds so unnatural and it sounds so stilted and so awful. But, you know, when, when you get good sales training, it's just amazing the difference it can make to your performance. It really does. Okay, so what were you doing at Centaur, Naraj, and how did that go and what lessons did you learn along the way? Uh, well, Centaur it was good old-fashioned magazine selling. So back in the 90s, magazines were the best ways to make money. They were bigger than exhibitions. Um, the internet really hadn't taken off for at least another 10 years. So, um, you know, it was fantastic. It was pretty much magazine selling. So it was classified sales. You had a tiny little advert in the back of the magazine. And I'd be selling those for, for 12 weeks, 24 weeks, 52 weeks. And then eventually I progressed to full-page ads. And then I, I became successful and launched yearbooks and I became successful not because I was particularly good I just I worked people that was it I put an extra hour a day in I okay. cared for my customers and I asked a few questions that was pretty much it I, I would say that while I was at Centaur I was above average because I had limiting skills but it was essentially it was hard work um, ask questions and genuinely care for the customer don't try and make a deal I, I knew that even when I was younger and if you did those three things back in the 90s, you'd have a decent career. You can't do that now. You have to do a lot more than that nowadays, of course. But back then, you could get away with that. Awesome. Okay. So you started progressing nicely, it sounds like, at Centaur. And kind of building your way up the ranks, as to say. And working on bigger and bigger pieces that you could sell. And how long were you there for, Naraj? Well, and actually, how did... 10 years, which is a very long time. Mm, but the thing is. was, they took good care of me. They paid me very well. And when you're a young kid and you've lots of commission coming in, it, it really helps. And when I was 25, I went to India because, you know, nowadays dating agencies are very common. Everybody has dating apps. It's quite a common thing to do. 
back in the 90s, True. only the most desperate people in the world went to dating agencies. And I was living in London. I had no friends. I, I, was, I was working really hard all day, commuting all day, coming home at night. And it was very lonely. I had no one to be with. So I joined a few dating agencies, which were truly horrendous experiences. People wouldn't turn up half the time. Oh, back man. in those days, nobody could text you and say, I'm not turning up. You just, you're there in a restaurant. There's, nobody called you. And it was, it was quite a lonely experience. Um, and That's then I rough. finally did find somebody who I really liked. Um, I, she was amazing. And then she cheated on me with a good friend of mine. So I, I went to India kind of broken hearted for a holiday. And so my mother, who for years been trying to set me up with an arranged marriage, which I objected to because they're ridiculous, um, set me up with an arranged marriage. And I was so vulnerable and so lonely. I said, yes. <laughs> and I met her for 20 minutes. And four days later, um, about 800 strangers turned up at the wedding. I had no idea who they were. And it was kind of overwhelming and scary. And next I know I got a bride who's 18 years old. I'm 25 in London. And it's like, oh God, what do I do? So when you suddenly get a house it's a tiny council house but i got a house and i'm married all of a sudden you just start doing better in sales because you have these huge responsibilities and having big responsibilities a lot of the best sales people i know have kids they got to take care of mortgages to pay uh, or in some cases if you don't have kids they got you know elderly parents are taken care of and i often find that in sales we've got a very strong why it's amazing how much you can achieve so true when I've, I've experienced the exact same, the rash. So when I've had some of the biggest stresses in my life, like about um, a year and a bit ago before I've, the company I'm at now, Web Choice, I've been at several times over the years, mainly because one of the directors is uh, my cousin and the other is a good friend. So um, I'm very, on very, very good terms with them. But to cut a, a long story short, um, I was working at another marketing agency but that all went very, very sour. In short, they tried to grow and expand too quick, took on all these sales staff. They're all terrible. As you know, many sales staff can interview the interview very, very well. It cuts to the chase. Month in, two months in, they've sold zero. They've given it the talk. So anyway, that kind of happened. That company went, went very um, badly very quickly. So I had to get out and um, went back to, to web choice where I am now. And like you say, month one, I just knew I had all these pressures on my head, obviously with a house mortgage, supporting my now fiance and various other things. When you've got the biggest stresses above your head, you need to perform to keep the money coming in. And that's when I've had some of my best months. So almost as a sales professional, it's better when you've got stress because then you put your head down, you really put the activity in and you have some of the best months in, or best sales months in your career. So I know exactly what you're talking about there. Not, not so much about the arranged marriage. So that, that must have been quite an experience in itself. That was kind of terrifying. I, I think, you know, when we got together, it's like we had nothing in common. We had no family nearby to help us out. We were just young kids. So we, none of our friends had been married. And, and back in those days, I wasn't as sociable. Now I'm a very social person. I'll walk into any networking event, just talk to people. And I quite enjoy doing that. But in my 20s, I was still kind of awkward. And I've been living alone for many, many years. So for me, it was just a bizarre experience. It really was. But we kind of had to make it work. And I think when our daughter was born, that kind of changed everything. And that brought us closer together. In all fairness, we had a good marriage for 21 years. When I say good, it was a good financial marriage. So she made me successful. I made her successful. We have an amazing daughter together. But yeah, but last year, tragically, it ended. It was very painful. But, you know, again, mm -hmm. you live and learn from those lessons. But uh, it was certainly a good lesson, certainly from a sales perspective, because when you have a strong why, I always ask salespeople who are underperforming or who are bored, you know, what's your reason you do this job? And if they tell me it's to go out to get pissed, <laughs> it, it, which a lot of people, young people do, it, it, they're not going to be very I was long the same. When I was probably 18, 3 to 25, I was probably the same. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what young kids care about. But it has to be more than that. And for a lot of people who want to go on nice holidays or get a car, their why is a bit stronger. But when the why is not about you, it's about other people, all of a sudden, that's where you see greatness in sales. You really do. Awesome. Yeah, I love, I love that, knowing your why and kind of when it gets to an important stage. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So you're at Centaur, going back to your career, Naraj, you're at Centaur for 10 years or so. Yeah. And like you're saying, you're progressing nicely. Um, how did that come to an end? Was there any more lessons or valuable golden nuggets that you learned along yeah, the way? Or what was next? Moving ahead of times is very important. So in 2001, 2002, we had the dot-com, of course, burst. And our competitors were starting to invest quite heavy digitally. 
and Centaur wasn't. Centaur had been a big beast of a company for many years, three massive buildings in London, very successful. And whenever you have a lot of success for a long time, Sam, there's a great danger of complacency. Uh, the board of directors just got complacent and they didn't invest in digital. And I remember in the office, there was about five or six of us using Internet Explorer on one machine. It was terrible. I mean, you're, you're literally queuing up in the morning to check the internet. I mean, we just didn't invest online properly and the branding wasn't very good. So it, it just didn't work. Whereas Haymarket really took off and Centaur was just slowly failing, failing. I just didn't see it growing. I felt I want to go with a more progressive company. And a former manager of mine um, had been working at the Guardian newspaper group. And okay. He was due to retire. His wife had loads of property in London and America. Uh, he was in his mid thirties and he retired. He went to live in Spain. He's still there actually retired. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he brought me, he's a really nice guy. And uh, he brought me on board and we had a chat. I said, okay, I'm not sure this will work, but let me try it. So I tried it for like a three month period and I couldn't believe how much success I had just because I picked up the phone. That was it. Everybody else was kind of taking incoming inquiries back in those days, but I was picking up the phone going after customers because it was a new event. I had to do that. And all of a sudden I had success and I just kept doing that, getting in front of people, picking up the phone, hustling, I think maybe lack of a better word. So I guess prospecting is a good takeaway there because with the Guardian, it was quite successful for a long time because people would call up and say, I want to book some advertising or I want to book a recruitment advert and they did very well. But when times got tough, the Guardian struggled massively because people all of a sudden, like, what do we do? And they end up just cutting jobs, jobs, jobs everywhere. But I stayed there pretty much till the end because I would pick up the phone and I'd go see customers. And that's a really valuable lesson to any salespeople anywhere. I mean, if you can't see customers because your boss doesn't give you a budget, then at least set up a Zoom call like this or a Skype yep. call or something. But don't just try and sell by email. Don't just try and sell over the phone. You've got to mix it up a little bit as well. Yeah, I think that's that's some really wise words, Naraj, especially in this era that we're in right now of the social selling um, kind of era where so many sales professionals, especially in the B2B business to business arena, are spending a lot of time on LinkedIn, scrolling through, myself included. We're all guilty of it from time to time. But like you say, there's, there's often nothing better than picking up the phone, mainly because a lot of sales reps now don't seem to do it quite as much <laughs> and rely on either LinkedIn direct message or emailing or any other channel to avoid the telephone. <laughs> so if you do give your customers or your prospective customers a call, it's, it's sometimes a nice surprise because the other people aren't willing to do it. So that's, that's great. Okay, cool. So you're working there for how long were you there, Naraj? And was there any other... Um, any other lessons learned apart from obviously prospecting, which is a fantastic one, and getting on the phone to drum up business? I would say prospecting. I would say also asking great questions. So we were chasing after a company. They used to be called Orange Phones. I think they were bought by EE or, or, or T-Mobile. Um, okay. And, um, you know, I remember I had a meeting with a marketing director at the time. And, you know, it took me a while to get that meeting. And in the meeting, asking questions. And he said to me afterwards, that was just that was a brilliant meeting. Thank you so much. And I said, hey, no problem. I was trying to think, I didn't sell particularly well. What, what did I do? But my boss was with me at the time because it was orange. My boss said, you asked so many great questions. And you found out the guy liked football. You really connected with him. I'm like, oh, okay. And nobody had ever really said to me in a meeting, that was a really good meeting. I, I, you're not like other salespeople. And I've been a bit sales for quite some time and nobody had really said that to me. So it was quite nice to hear. And I thought, okay, if I spend more time connecting with people and asking great questions, uh, it makes business more fun. It's nice for my ego, of course. But then a month later, for the first time ever, Orange sponsored one of our events uh, for £20,000. I'm like, oh, okay, fantastic. I'm, I'm doing something right here. So all of a sudden, I started asking more and more questions in events and getting more business events and getting more business from customers and getting more repeat business and getting more recommendations. So you know, when you go into a customer and your goal isn't, I must get this deal, but your goal is, I really want to help this person as much as possible. All of a sudden, it just, it, it, it changes the game. Uh, it makes sales more enjoyable and it also makes it much easier to get business as well. I love that. I love that. I know I learned the hard way, especially in sales, because when I was uh, in my younger days, I, I was very much guilty of just showing up and throwing up and just getting there. <laughs> feeling all the benefits yeah. basically a prospect would say look I'm, I'm interested in this 
So in my case, it might be a website or a digital marketing strategy. I'd start reeling off all the features, the benefits before I had any clue what they wanted, what they needed, or even more importantly, if we're, we're a good fit to do some business together. And I was doing that for years until eventually kind of started investing in reading some, some decent books, listening to podcasts, um, learning from other successful sales guys. And then actually learned that just like you say, asking questions is pretty much the most important part of the sales process because without asking those questions, how do you know? It doesn't matter if you're in business, if you're in sales, marketing, without asking important questions, how do you know that you're going to be able to work together? Mm -hmm. And in many cases you may not be, but it's good to know early. That's true. So that's, yeah, that's a great piece of the piece of advice. Naresh. So it sounded like um, things started to go good when you're at that company. So you got some big contracts by the sounds of it. It was fantastic, but you know, quite often in life, you know, curveballs happen and unexpected things happen. I think we're currently seeing this at the moment with a virus where yeah. so many businesses are going through really harsh times, myself included. I've had two speaking gigs canceled, which means I don't get paid. Um, I've had a sales training move from April to end of June. So I don't get paid till end of June. You know, a lot of people are losing money and, and a, lot of, a lot of, when bad times happen, it's a lot of panic happens. And I'd written through the recession of 2008 really well. But all of a sudden, the Guardian were still cutting jobs because I didn't see them investing their staff much. They were just cutting jobs, cutting jobs. And one day I was told my job wasn't needed anymore. And I'm like, I'm making almost half a million pounds for you guys. I'm making a lot of money. And they replaced me with somebody half my age who'd been in sales for a year because they were cheap. I remember I begged the AMD, please don't do this. This is a terrible decision. The, the show will collapse. Um, do not replace me just for the sake of saving, you know, 40 odd thousand pounds a year for somebody else. But, you know, a lot of people on the boards of directors and they always think they know better. That, that's a sad thing I found about business. People sad. always think sad. they know what they're doing. And they often don't. They just have a degree or they have the CEO supporting them. But it doesn't mean you're good at your job. But anyway, so that was a bit of a shock to the system. And I went through a really bad time for a few months. And this is a very good lesson to learn in sales is that, it's not what happens to you, it's how you react. And I, I reacted very badly because I've been in sales 15 years and for the first time ever, I'd lost a job. And I remember being very angry, very angry and very bitter because I'd been there almost what, five years and there was no leaving party. There was no goodbye. Nobody kept in touch. I was a non-entity after all the work I'd done, everything I contributed towards them, nobody cared. And that really hurt me. And it affected me quite badly. And then again, it was my daughter, my, my, my wife at the time, my father, who just said, look, sort yourself out here. Uh, my ex-wife at the time said, look, you've got to become a manager. You can't be a salesperson your whole life. You've got to learn to manage people. And I said, look, I don't want to be a manager. All managers do is spend all day in meetings. It's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> you have to become one. Financially, you have to become one. It will lead to other things. And so I, were, I just thought, I don't want to be doing this. I remember feeling sorry for myself one day in the bookshop and I was actually in W.H. Smith's and I went to read a book in the self-help section and I arrived there and there was a few middle-aged women in cardigans and sandals and I was, I was really embarrassed and I rushed back downstairs, went to the football magazine section to read football magazines. <laughs> that's, my, that's my safe place. And on the way, I came across a very popular magazine at the time called Success. And it was yeah. about how to change your life, how to make more money, how to improve. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. Um, people like Tony Robbins and, and Les Brown and, and Jim Rowan, all these masters of personal development and success. And I'm reading this and it's like, oh, the more you help other people, the better your life becomes. No self-pity, which is what I was doing at the time. Go out there and get it. Nothing's going to come to you in life. And I, I never really invested in myself or in personal development before because nobody really told me to. Um, and I think it's a good lesson in sales, or two good lessons in sales. First of all, you become the people you hang out with. So in sales, don't hang out with people who binge watch TV for three hours a night. You know, hang out with some people who are successful as well, because you learn a lot from them. Uh, and the second thing is really invest massively in yourself. So I started investing in myself on a personal level. And that changed me. And all of a sudden, I'm getting interviews again, and I'm getting roles to become a sales manager. And that's, I had a few options at UBM. Uh, one was at Informa. Ironically, UBM had bought Informa now. But yeah, at the time, they were two separate companies. Um, and I, I took the Informa job because they offered me sales training and management training. And that, that was a game changer to my career. All of a sudden, I went from being above average to being super successful 
to being number one, to winning the chief sales officers clubs, to getting holidays, wow. to getting perks. And all of a sudden my career skyrocketed because I had a coach. I got coached. I went in training sessions and they really invested in me as a company. It was the best thing that ever they could ever do. And it was the best thing to have happened to me personally. Fantastic. Okay. So you raised some good points back then, Naraj, especially the, the self-development part. And that's something I'm certainly guilty of up until the, the most recent kind of few years in terms of investing in myself, in terms of both books, listening to podcasts, listening to vi- watching videos um, from various kind of well-known sales professionals and just, yeah, there's, there's so much out there to learn. And like you say, um, when, when you work more so in a small business, it's, it's often quite difficult. So for example, I'm the main sales guy where I work. So there's not necessarily other sales professionals that I can listen to or chat to in my arena. So my only source to get that valuable information is to go online, listen to podcasts, watch uh, videos on YouTube or buy books. But like you say, you've got to either spend the time or invest in yourself and it will, it does help you a lot. So from the sounds of it, your career really, really skyrocketed because you had a coach, you had that training and that, that took you to the next level, did it? Oh, massively. I mean, I've never had such big, you look at it first from a material level, then a personal level. I think that's how it works a lot of the time. And all of a sudden your, your salary is going, not just a typical two or 3,000 pound a year, but 35 basic to 44 basic. And it just gets higher and higher. And the commission goes from 10,000 to 20,000 to 30,000. The perks get higher. And at the beginning it's the perks, it's the excitement, it's your ego getting massaged, it's great. But then after that, you're taking care of your family you're um, having lovely holidays, you're giving a lot to charity, and all of a sudden you start to get fulfilled on a personal level. And that's the thing a lot of people miss out on. They, they chase the financial side a lot, and that's great, but it doesn't last you very long. But when you start to get the emotional fulfillment in sales, that's when sales becomes the best job, it really does. Then you love going into work, and you come into work with an excitement every day that most people just don't have. Because now I'm a coach in sales offices, I see so many people coming in, chatting to their mates, going on LinkedIn, having a coffee, checking their phone, going to the toilet, having a coffee, liking a lot of posts on LinkedIn. Maybe they'll make a first call at 11 o'clock. Nobody's in or they get rejected. They spend two hours doing emails. You know, it's just, it's a tedious, awful process in most offices. And if it wasn't for Google AdWords and incoming inquiries and repeat businesses, many businesses wouldn't even exist. They really wouldn't because I don't see many people picking up the phone. Now, there are companies I've walked into which are just buzzing and they're just a pleasure to work with, but most companies aren't like that. Most companies are like libraries and they're so quiet and people, it's just, there's not much of a buzz there. And I think a good lesson to learn is it's very important to have a manager who can get the team fired up. And it's really important as a manager, not just to come into the office and be separate from your team. It's important to sit with your team. And that's something I've always done because I've worked with managers who are in a different building still doing the same job or their meetings all day and they're never there and you've got to have someone who can lead from the front and if you lead by example your team will do very very well awesome okay Naresh. so moving forwards how did you eventually come up with the idea that you wanted to start off your own sales and um, training and coaching business how did that idea come about and what were the steps that you took to actually make that happen um well the time at informa the first three years are probably almost the first four, four years were the best of my life. I had an amazing time. I was incredibly lucky to be there. And then the CEO left, new CEO came on board. The culture changed. It became about making profit. The camaraderie kind of disappeared. Uh, people started homeworking more. Um, and when you homework in a sales team, you do lose a bit of the bond. And I got a new boss who was, who was awful. He's the kind of guy who would come in and, and sort of, it was a carrot and stick approach. Do this or else. You know, if you don't hit your target this month, mate, how are you going to pay the mortgage? You know, he would, he would leave by threatening you. And he was very intimidating. And he intimidated the whole team because all of us had families at the time apart from one person. So we were kind of like, jeepers, this guy's a bit intense. And because the CEO and the bosses seemed to support him 100%, anytime we try and challenge him, he would take clients away from us. And all of a sudden, I'm losing a lot of my clients because I'm talking back to this guy and standing up for myself and standing up for my team. And it was, it was pretty awful. And Informa didn't deal with it very well at all. And I just started to lose respect for them as an organization. And I thought, okay, what do I do? So I spoke to a few of my colleagues saying, look, you've always worked in these big companies. Why don't you go work for a smaller company and make a bigger difference? I thought, that's a great idea. I've never worked for a small business before. So I went to work for a company called Caspian. And in the interview, 
They told me I was amazing. They told me I was the best thing since sliced bread. They gave me a massive pay rise. And of course, I accepted the job, which was so silly. But, you know, <laughs> you know sometimes you, you make silly decisions. And I accepted the job there. And they promised me a new website. They promised me a marketing manager. And of course, when I got there, the, the website was a disaster. There was no marketing manager. Nothing happened. It was just terrible. And the guy who hired me after four months, they got rid of him. And he was the main guy. I'm like, oh, my God. And then a few months later, they brought me into the office saying, um, yeah, it's, it's not working. Goodbye. No handshake, nothing. And I was kind of taken by surprise. And a year later, Caspian went under in liquidation. And oh I know this because a lot of the staff approached me for references. And that was kind of a scary, that kind of really jolts you. And I'm like, oh, God, this is not kind of working the way I expected. And then I went to work for somebody else, a family-run business. That lasted eight weeks. Um, the boss's daughter, this is why you don't work for a family-run business. The, the boss put his daughter in charge. And uh, she wasn't treating people very well. And I said, look, you're not paying people properly. You're not paying them their money. They're, everybody's done happy in this space. You've got to give people some respect. And I went on a pre-booked holiday. And I got an email to say, I'm shocked the way you spoke to me. You're fired. And I'm like, oh, God, this is terrible. This is, this is two, two times in a row. This is, something's, something's happening here which isn't quite right. I wasn't sure what it was at the time. I, I, I thought, am I, am I being difficult? Am I being arrogant? You know, there's quite often things happen in business, and you have no idea why they're happening. And I thought, you know what? Working in corporate London, all this commuting, giving everything to other people, and being treated so badly isn't right. I'm going to treat people better. I'm going to have my own business and grow it and treat people with respect, treat people the way they should be treated, and also coach them properly, because there's so many bad salespeople out there. And I look back at all my life thinking, no matter how much sales I've done, not many people can sell. So I wanted to write a book that would kind of educate people and okay, teach cool. them how to sell properly, and that's how the whole book and the idea of running my own business came around. I uh, got it. So what came first or was it a combination of things? Because it sounds like, like you said, Naresh, the, the last couple of jobs you had before you came up with the idea to start your own business had truly awful management and it kind of sent you to the edge by the sounds of it. And um, then you decided to, to start up on your own. And did you write the book whilst you were starting up on your own or how did that happen? Um, I wrote the book while I was kind of considering things. Um, okay, cool. The book was kind of half written, but it's like I said, you've got to have a strong why sometimes. And when you don't have a job or an income, all of a sudden you have a very strong why. <laughs> you've got a really strong reason to do something. <laughs> and, um, sure. you know, I, I've read, as you can see, my, my bookshelf up there, and that used to be 10 years ago, full of DVDs and cheap fiction and, and box sets. And, and, and now it's full of, you know, personal development books, books on leadership, management, sales. I, I'm, I'm quite a voracious reader. Nowadays, I still read, but I listen more to podcasts like yours. I watch a lot of YouTube videos as well. As well. I kind of make, it's almost like selling. I used the phone, email, LinkedIn, the post. With learning, I use different mediums. So last week I was on holiday, so I was listening to podcasts almost nonstop. Whereas this week I'm back, you know, today I woke up, I read for half an hour before I spoke to you. So it depends where I am on my learning, but that does make a big difference. And I thought all these sales books are good, but they all, many of them are quite similar in theme. There are a few exceptions, like, you know, Jeffrey Gittimer's Little Red Book of Selling is quite amazing. And there are a few exceptions, but most of them are, are kind of similar. And how do I stand out? Because there's so many good writers out there and so many good sales books. So I know in sales, one of the best ways to sell, Sam, is storytelling. And people in sales don't use storytelling enough. And I thought, okay, what if I tell my book as a story about my life in sales? And each chapter, you have a lesson you can learn. And that's how, kind of how it came about. So it was kind of a risky thing to do at the time. But looking back, it was actually quite a smart idea. And, yeah, it um, sounds like a great idea. I like it. It's great because people remember, you know, if you tell somebody a fax and you tell somebody a story, there's 10 times more likely to remember the story. They just are. And that's what happened. The book became, you know, everybody works in sales. And I released it. And all of a sudden, I, mean, I promoted it very heavily, of course. And all of a sudden it's in the amazon top 100 and then 97 and 98 and then it's number 43 opposite simon sinek i'm like oh my god i took a awesome. picture i put it on linkedin <laughs> the more copies sold and all of a sudden i'm number 20 with with richard branson losing my virginity and then i took a picture put it on amazon me his book my book more copies so i just kept consistently selling copies so from a success point of view the book did amazingly well but the big mistake I made, and this is a good sales lesson here, 
I put all my energy into the book. I didn't put energy into running the business. I didn't think about sales training. I only had one source of income. It's like having one client, so to speak. So I had this one book, which was amazing. And for the first three months, the royalties were superb. I'm making good money. I'm really proud of myself. But then after three months, the book dropped out. <laughs> All of a sudden, it's not in the top 100. It's 500, then it's 1,000, then it's number 5,000. Like, uh. Yeah, I think I'm we've all been there as well. And I think I know where you're going with this in the sense that much like with your book, we've all had that one customer that brings us the majority of our sales and um, you kind of rely on them after a while. And rather than hunting for new business and trying to source new customers, you know that they're going to be bringing the money, bringing the money. But in my experience, especially no customer is ever sticky forever. And what I mean by that is customers come and go, even if you serve them as best you can, then they don't always last forever. So like much like you say, you need to look at other avenues. And exactly. And I think that's flowing. what the salespeople make. They've got quite small funnels. They speak to the same salespeople and they don't go out and get new business. And that, that again goes back to what I said earlier about the importance of prospecting. Um, and I just kept doing the same thing, same thing. So I sold more copies of my book than most sales authors. But those sales authors have income from their courses. They speak at events. They do sales training. I wasn't doing that at all. I only focused on the book. So it's a double-edged sword. And one way I'm very proud but at the same time, I shouldn't have focused so much on the book. I should have thought of other areas of income or other areas of growth in my business. And that's one advice I give to anybody running a business. Don't just have one source of income. Have multiple sources. Because now I have multiple sources. No one source is huge, but together they're very good, if you know what I mean. Great stuff. Okay. So how long have you been running your business now, Narash? Um, it's just been over uh, so two years and one month. Um, awesome. which has been amazing but you know I've learned so much I would never have learned this much working for somebody else uh, when you run your own business you have to learn twice as fast uh, you have twice as many problems you know and you have to work them out twice as quick I mean everything is so much harder um, but my advice you mentioned you have a lot of client a lot of listeners and readers who are business owners and in terms of business growth there's so many mistakes I made especially in the first year Sam it's just incredible um, so yeah, I'm, it'd be good to learn some of the kind of the mistakes, some of the lows that happened and how you overcome those, Naresh. Yeah, I would say the first thing is, if you're going to set a business up, have six, preferably 12 months salary in your bank account. <laughs> That's really important. Don't underestimate the importance of cash flow. Um, I had three months in my account and then I had royalties coming in. But after, six, after that six months, it's like, oh, how do I pay the bills? How do I, I don't know what to do. And all of a sudden summer arrived. And in the summertime, nobody wanted to hire me. I just couldn't find work. And then all of a sudden, my wife's supporting me, which is nice for a, a month or so. But after a while, it becomes embarrassing as a grown man. that Your wife had to support you. And I'm very grateful of Baron. She was amazing. She really believed in me. And she supported me for many, many months. I'll always be very grateful to her for that. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't still be in business if, without her belief and her, you know, she knew how good I was. And she pushed me more towards the coaching side. She goes, look, the book is great. But when you speak at events, you're making no money to stop it and focus on your training because that's what you're good at. You're a good coach. I see the difference you make with people. That's what you should be doing. And so I focus more on the coaching and training side. Um, but what surprised me is despite having all this experience and writing a best-selling book, it's actually very hard to find sales coaching. It really is. I was quite surprised. I went back to the Guardian. They're like, yeah, we couldn't care less. And I didn't want to go back to Informa. I couldn't go back to Caspian because... They were about to go under and all of a sudden, like, who do I call for business? And all of a sudden, I'm starting off with a blank sheet thinking, oh, God, I, I, I'm cold calling people. I would cold call. I live in Milton Keynes and you've got all these head offices, Santander, you've got Volkswagen, Mercedes, uh, Suzuki, all these companies. And I'm calling them up saying, hey, I'm a best selling author. I've got all this experience. You know, I'd love to work with a sales coach. Like, we already have one. <laughs> Goodbye. And I'm like, oh, no. And it was, oh, man. It was a disaster. And how I ended up getting work was I ended up just going to a lot of events okay. speaking for free, but speaking so well, the people afterwards would come up to me and go, that was really good. And they'd buy my book, maybe potentially get some coaching, but buy my book at least. And the book meant they would contact me and say, thank you. And then I'd say, well, I'm not, hey, no problem. I'm glad you like the book. What sales challenges are you having at the moment? And then we'd talk some more and then we'd get to the coaching. And so it was a slow, tedious process, 
but that was how I got my first clients. And then the second thing I learned to do was leverage LinkedIn. Most people still can't use LinkedIn properly. They do posts that aren't that interesting, that are often just press releases, which nobody really cares about. So I really had to learn LinkedIn. And I went on Daniel Disney's social selling course. And that, awesome. that, was, a, okay. that was amazing. That was a game. I mean, the fact that I paid all that money to go on his course, I think surprised him. But we met and we just got on so well. We've become really good friends now. And we help, we support each other. And he's just a great guy. And I learned so much from him. And all of a sudden, I had, I'd been using LinkedIn for 10 years without that much success. And all of a sudden, I'm getting more likes, which nobody really cares about. But then I get more comments. And then I started to get a few inquiries. And all of a sudden, I'm writing articles and posts and good content. So it took me a while to get into it. But after six months, I was flying. And LinkedIn inquiries now account for about 40% of my business. So Amazing. Okay. You've got to leverage LinkedIn. That's a big, big thing running your own business. Just working in sales, leverage LinkedIn, have multiple sources of income, have at least six to 12 months cash in your account. Uh, th these are probably the three of the most valuable lessons I learned. Those are some sound advice, um, pieces of advice there, Naraj, especially for anyone thinking of starting a business in terms of has having those cash reserves ready. Um, so that's really good. And I like the, the first point you raised. So it sounds like you're offering a bit of a free hook. So in terms of going to do a, a free speaking event, and then you got a few people come up to you and say, look, I, I really enjoyed your work. That was a great, a great talk. They went on to buy your book and then you kept in contact with them, kind of nurtured the lead as to say, and then eventually some of those became actually bookings for your work. So that's yeah, that's, that's, Awesome. And in our, our line of work, we offer something similar, but it's more, more like a, it's we're a digital marketing company. It's more like a free consultation or a free initial quote. So we'll have a, a phone call or an email conversation with the customer as the kind of 30 minute free consultation. Then we'll work it from there really to put them along the sales funnel. So yeah, that's, that's really good. And LinkedIn, of course, as, as I go on off, often about this shows a fantastic platform, much like you, we get a lot of inbound work from there. But as you say, you've got to put an investment into it and you've got to put out decent content and you've got to engage with others' content to get the results. So, yeah, that's, that's awesome. So those are some great, great tips of advice, Naresh. Um, are there any other digital marketing channels? On this show, we do like to take the digital marketing angle of how digital has helped your business to grow. Mm. Um, are there any other digital marketing channels that you recommend for businesses, Naresh, to help them? Yes. Uh, the big one for me, I would say, from a digital marketing perspective, is have your own weekly, well, Newsletter is not a great word. I call it weekly sales tips. So every week you should be sending content to your database and you should be sending content that gives them massive value. So I, I do newsletter every Thursday because at midday, I, I try to do a lot of my content around midday because people are just about to have lunch. It's a good time. Um, eight o'clock in the morning is also very good and five o'clock in the evening. Historically, those are the three best times to release content on LinkedIn. So I kind of figured I'll do my newsletter around the same thing. I tried eight o'clock in the morning. I tried five o'clock at night. Midday got the most opens and engagement. So I, I stuck to midday and I do four newsletters a month. Uh, three of those newsletters are giving massive value. And the fourth newsletter gives some value and then says, here's an offer, I want you to work with me. I, I don't like discounting I, and I've stopped doing that um, because at the beginning I would give discounts. I'd get a client, but they wouldn't read book because they, they wanted a discount again. So again, that's a good lesson to learn. Don't discount, okay? Um, it's okay at the beginning to offer a, a complimentary strategy session or a, a free talk. Sometimes you have to do these things, but when you work with people, don't discount. My first year in business, I discounted a lot because I was desperate for business. And unfortunately, you often attract the wrong kinds of people. And those kinds of people don't show you any loyalty at all. Now, I don't have that many clients, but my God, they're fantastic clients. They pay me on time. They don't question what I charge and they're brilliant. They recommend me to other people. They give me testimonials. They give shout outs to me on LinkedIn. Those are the kind of customers you want. So don't focus on having so many customers, focus on having brilliant customers who really have your back and wanna to talk to you about upselling, new opportunities, you know, who will recommend you to their network. But those are the kind of customers you want. Um, and I guess that's a good lesson learned in sales. A lot of people will sell one thing to a customer, but Sam, they won't think of upselling. You should do that. They won't think of asking the customer for a testimonial. That's one of the first things you should do if a customer says they're happy. So I'm really glad you're happy. That's great news. You know, in business is so important. Testimonials mean a lot. 
And if you're really happy, would you be kind enough just to do me a few lines on LinkedIn to say how happy you were? And most of them will say yes. And then a week later, you call them back saying it hasn't been done yet because <laughs> you know, they forget. And say, look, if it's really, if you're, if it's really busy, you want me to write it for you and you can tweak it. They go, no, 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 I'll do it myself. And then they do it themselves. And you know, testimonials do matter. And in my line of work, if you look at so many sales training people, so many sales coaches, they have very few recommendations on LinkedIn. That really surprises me. I have about 35 people. Most of them are in the last year who said, Nair, I just helped my business because of Nair, I just training. I'm doing so much better. We've earned so much money because of what he's taught. You know, these things is what helped build a career. And I'm always saying get testimonials because it really does matter. Great stuff. Yeah, I've, I've, found, I've found the same. And I've always found in terms of asking for testimonials or recommendations, because um, it's a big part of, like you say, your business. A lot of times people say, look, I'd, I'd love to work with you, but I need to see a few references. Yeah. So in terms of getting reviews, we use Google reviews quite a lot, not just because it's a good place to put reviews, but also helps your Google positioning. So things like search engine optimization. So that's a, a nice little tip for anyone. Now, I've often found as soon as you do a piece of good work and the customer says, oh, awesome, I'm really pleased with this, that's the, that's the time to click in and say, please do the review because they're happy and they can't really say no. Um, <laughs> but going back, Naraj, to your previous point about discounting, we've all been there. Um, we're all guilty of it in, in some, some years gone by where people say, look, I'd, I'd love to do the business with you, Naraj. I'd love to go for this, let's say, 10K sales training gig, but can you do me 20% off and we'll sign today, we'll pay today. How do you overcome that, Naraj? Oh, very, very simple. So the biggest mistake salespeople make when somebody asks for a discount is they start selling again. Say, no, 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 you're getting this, you're getting this, you're getting this. That's the worst thing you can possibly do. And it's an almost guaranteed way to mean you'll lose a deal or end up giving a discount. So never start selling. If somebody asks for a 20% discount, I always say to them, was there something I didn't quite explain clearly enough? <laughs> you know, I think that's very important um, because I want them to really understand the value I'm giving them. And uh, if they say yes, I'll say, well, what is it that I didn't quite explain clearly enough? Just something I've missed because sometimes people hold back or sometimes you haven't asked enough questions at the beginning to really find out what the big concern is. And then quite often you'll find out they've done something similar in the past and they've been burned by it. Um, or quite often had a bad similar experience before. Or quite often you just haven't explained things clear enough to them. So what I, I do is I take it a step back I'll ask a few more questions. I'll talk them through the process again. And at the very end, I remind them what the price is. <laughs> and again, I go through that process. And sometimes people go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And sometimes people go, actually, you know what? I still want a discount. I, 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 I don't want 20%, maybe give me 10% now. And I'll often ask them, you know, what's your favorite car? It's a really good question to ask, what's your favorite car? Um, with men, it's very easy. They'll often say a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. I'm saying, okay, <laughs> if you went to a Ferrari garage and asked for a 10% discount, what would they ask? What would they say? They wouldn't let us have it. I said, exactly. Well, I'm the Ferrari of sales coaches or I'm the Mercedes of sales coaches. I'm the Audi R8 of sales coaches. Um, and that's how I talk. I talk, with, again, storytelling, analogy. So they wouldn't give you a discount. And by the way, just to make it very clear, when I coach you, I'll be coaching you to never discount because when you discount, you devalue your product. And it's never nice working with somebody when you discount. That's something I'll be teaching you. And again, I reinforce it again. Now, looking at my current client database, there's only one client I discount. Only one out of all my clients. But in return, he doesn't get much of a discount, but in return, he recommends me to his network. So I don't mind giving a discount because I've earned a lot of business from his network. He's recommended me. He's done posts for me on LinkedIn. So for me, financially, it's been worth it more long-term. So if you can exchange value of some kind, Sam, as a last option, look at a value exchange. I really like that. And I really like the fact that when someone's asking for a discount, you're kind of questioning, you're like, help me understand what have I done wrong here? And <laughs> Make it your fault, you're, basically, okay. you're basically sounding like you're, you're, you, they've made you really weak. You're like, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand if I missed something. And then you're forcing them to go to kind of recap and bring up the issue. So then you can address it. So that's, that's awesome tip. That's, that's great for business owners, sales professionals, and everyone else tuning in. So awesome. All right, we've covered a, a whole bunch, Naraj. Um, we've learned your story. We've learned um, kind of how you've, you've grown along the way up to starting your own business and writing a, a best-selling novel. Um, going back to digital quickly, is there one thing that businesses should be doing with digital marketing, Naraj, that can benefit them from today? 
Um, in addition to the newsletter, or I should say the sales content stroke sales insight or tips your business should be giving every week, no matter what, because that's how you build a relationship with your customers. Um, I often, I find recently video to be very effective. So by doing more video, people are now connecting more with video than actually written content. And video is very important. Uh, don't shoot a video in your car. It looks so bad. I mean, again, if you're very well known, you can do this. But if you're a professional, actually show yourself in a customer's office or in a really unique environment that don't just walk and talk with a camera shaking. It looks ridiculous. Um, like I said, successful people get away with it. Um, but just have a proper lighting system. It only costs 200 pounds to get a microphone and good lights. That's it. Um, shoot a video, 60 to 90 seconds, um, have subtitles, and you'll find you get a lot more engagement doing that than just doing an email. Because people, you know, Sam, nobody ever says to me, God, I wish I had more emails. <laughs> nobody says that. Um, nobody no. says, I, I about, but you send a video, people often engage with that a lot more. So it's definitely, you know, when I watched your podcast, I didn't listen to it. I watched it. Um, so, you know, video is very powerful and effective and video should definitely be 100% part of your digital marketing strategy. 100% agree. And as LinkedIn over the last year or so rolled out the personal video message or the personal video feature rather that you can do in a direct message, that's, that's something that I've been starting to tap into with new connections. Or whenever I get a referral to someone, I'll um, send them a short video or even an audio clip because it just helps you stand out, Naraj, like you yeah. say, because hardly anyone's doing it. I think only 1% of um, everyone on LinkedIn actually puts content regularly. So if you're part of that 1% and then you're sending personalized videos or personalized audio messages to your ideal target customer, you're, you're going to stand out in a competitive marketplace. So that's, that's a nice piece of advice. Awesome. Okay. Well, everybody, you've been listening or tuning in to Sam's Business Growth Show, where we interview business leaders, experts, and entrepreneurs from around the globe. We find out their story, how digital marketing has helped along the way, and the exclusive tips and insights to skyrocket your own business. Um, you've been listening to Naraj. Naraj, what I like to ask everyone at the end of the show is if you could thank just one person, either dead or alive, for having a positive influence on your life and your career, who would that be and why? That's a tough one um, because there has been quite a lot of people who have been great to me. Uh, my first coach, my first mentor. I'd probably say my grandfather, ironically. Um, I, I was lucky enough to live with my grandfather for many years. Um, because in Indian traditions, your, 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 your parents get ill. You don't put them in a, a home. They come living in the house. So there's me, my parents, my sister, my brother, my grandparents, all living in this one house. And I got a chance to learn a lot about him uh, when he did live with us. You know, he, he was one of the first Indians in Northern Ireland in 1951. He spent weeks in a boat coming over. And he had to knock door to door from people's houses selling clothes. He was qualified for nothing. And that's how he made his living for five years. He would get up, whether it was sunny, shiny, raining, a lot of the time freezing, miserable, snowing, doesn't matter, on his feet every day from eight o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night. That's what he did for five years until he had a shop. And then his shop became, he had a, lived in a place called Bally Castle, which is about eight miles from Giant's Causeway. For 35 years, it became the place everybody went to to buy their clothes. And again, he's a classic salesman of never gave up, had nothing else, no other qualifications, incredibly resourceful. And everything he did, he did for his wife and he did for his six children. And then I discovered later on as well, he gave loads of money back to charities in Northern Ireland and loads to charities in India. So again, uh, without being that aware, but that's how I live my life. Because what I do is the same. I do what I do for my family, for my daughter, to give back, to support young salespeople for charity. My why is very strong which is why I love doing what I'm doing. So probably, yeah, my grandfather. Love that. Love that. And that's a brilliant story. And much like yourself, Naraj, I want to get to a point in my career. I, I feel very much the same where not only can I help my own family, but I can help others. And mm. I think that's, that's a really big thing. So like you say, sales is one of those careers where you can almost control what you earn by the effort and the activity you put in. So being able to give back is an awesome point. And yeah. I love that story about your grandfather. That's, that's awesome. So, um, Fantastic. How can people get in touch with yourself, Naraj? Tell us a little bit more about your business and how everyone can connect with you. Sure. Well, what I do is my sales training and coaching, it's about getting people results. So again, in the last eight years especially, I've, had, I've worked with so many train, training companies that the companies I work for hired. And I've seen some truly horrendous sales trainers. They come in with like a USB stick, put it into a laptop, 
and you're watching PowerPoint slides all day, that is not sales training. And you should never work with someone who does that ever because they're not doing you a good service, okay? Sales training should be high energy. So my sales training has loads of exercises, team bondings. You know, you're gonna have lots of energy for sales. And the second thing is I don't use PowerPoint for eight hours. I use a flip chart or a whiteboard. I ask you the questions, you give the answers. Once sales training is interactive, Sam, it's exciting, it's energetic, and people just enjoy it more. And the third thing is you gotta keep people accountable in, in sales training, which again, most coaches come in, you pay them a couple of thousand pounds, they're gone. With me, you have to have takeaways, which you have to implement. And the following week, I call you as part of the package to say, okay, how are you getting on? Have you implemented this? Because you promised me you would, your name is here, you've signed it and dated it, that's your promise. When people make you those promises, they're more likely to implement them. So that's how my training is different than most people's. It's very interactive and I keep people accountable. And if you want to get hold of me, the best way is very simply through LinkedIn um, or through everybodyworksinsales.com. But knowing what people are like, LinkedIn is probably how they'll track me down. <laughs> Excellent. And what's your handle on LinkedIn? Um, it's LinkedIn you? forward slang as N Kapoor. Uh, N K A P U R. I've never actually linked in myself, but yeah, if you type no in worries, there, we'll put it on the show description anyway. <laughs> all good, all good. There, thankfully. Awesome. So the show is sponsored by WebChoiceUK.com, helping businesses grow with results-driven digital marketing, search engine optimization, and conversion-focused web design, as well as custom mobile applications and web development. Naraj, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Subscribe today for more digital marketing, sales and business growth tips from the experts.